Honey, your slip is showing. <laughs> Honey, how many times did I hear that? Gary, go over and tell that lady her slip is showing. <laughs> Leave it to mama. <laughs> Slips, as almost all of you at this mass know, <laughs> Slips were those underneath thingies that women wore everywhere, underneath, just underneath their skirts. And they were meant to do, people have different opinions about this, but some would say, for modesty's sake, so you can't see through things. Others would say, because it was a softer touch to the wool of many skirts in those days. This is probably up until the 80s, 1980 or so. And so there's a lot of reason they wore them. They were part of almost every attire, as I remember it from those old days. And every once in a while, they slipped. The slip slipped. That's probably why they called it. I never thought of that before. That's probably... <laughs> wow. And now it was showing underneath the skirt, and it frankly looked really stupid. <laughs> that is supposed to be where slips are worn, underneath. But no one seems to wear slips anymore. Yet we do have so much underneath of, hidden underneath of us that we would hope would never slip out. Emotions we hope no one would ever see. Thoughts that we thought were just ours, but now all of a sudden people are picking up on what we're thinking. I could also say of any of us, myself included, on any given day, honey, your judgments are showing. Honey, your judgments are showing. All those criticisms, all those judgments you think are going on just inside your head, just and only inside your head, they're showing. And you have no idea how much they're showing. And it makes you look stupid, just like those sagging slips. It makes you look like something's wrong with you. Your negativity is showing. Your negativity is showing in that fake laugh you put on when you really don't mean it. It's showing in you looking away and not making eye contact with this other human being. It's showing in that smug face and that smirk of a smile. And people see it. And they so wish you would fix it. Eleanor Roosevelt nailed it. She nailed it when she wrote, Watch your thoughts. They soon become words. Watch your words. They soon become actions. Watch your actions. They soon become habits. Watch your habits. They soon become your character. And watch your character because it will become your destiny. Notice how she starts. Watch your thoughts. She starts right where St. Paul starts. She's giving precisely the advice that Paul was giving to this beloved community of disciples in Philippi. When he said to them, haven't you the same attitude the same attitude that Christ had. If you want to be happy, you're going to have to work on your attitude, he said. You have to have the mind, the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ, and it must be common to all of us. And this is the way you guard your mind, he says. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about those things. Think about those things first. Keep on doing what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. Then will you know the God of peace.
if you want to be happy, Eleanor and Paul said, start with your mind. Start with your attitude. Paul is teaching that the reason we find it hard to ever know the peace of Christ in our hearts is because of our attitude the mind we live with day in and day out that keeps that peace from ever being realized. All because the mind operates in terms of contrariness. The mind is always pushing back against something else. It likes to be against something. It likes to have someone else to criticize, someone else to give all the problems to. For some reason, we base ourselves in criticism, and for some reason, we're okay with that. Most of us are probably totally unaware of that, but it's true. The mind likes to have someone to criticize. It likes to have someone to look down on, someone to attribute all of our problems to. If I can base myself in anger or fear or judgment, it makes me feel quite wonderful about myself. It makes me think the problem is out there and not me. The problem is not me, I'd like to believe. The problem is you. The problem is my, those other people in my family, the other people in our community, in our parish, that president, that bishop, that pastor, that political party, always, 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 someone else. The mind makes someone else the problem. Please be honest with yourself right now. Be honest with yourself. You know you do that. It's not just your husband or your wife or your boss or somebody else at work who does that. You do that. I do it too. I don't like that in me. I've been working on that my entire life. What Paul is giving us here is some advice. It might be what some would call the power of positive thinking. We can poo-poo that concept all we want, yet none of us, none of us would ever poo-poo the power of a positive thought. We know the power of being positive in our minds about people, about events, about the world, about the church, about anything. We know it. I'm telling you, we must actively work for positive thinking, otherwise it goes south. If we don't actively work, work on having positive thoughts, it goes negative. Almost all the time it defaults to negative. Unless we realize the power of a good attitude, positive mind, the mind of Christ, and work hard, oh my gosh, work hard, to have the right mind. Because we know if we don't, it will go negative. We like to think critically of other things and other people, and it's not long before it takes over everything. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, everything, from our words to our character. It ends up taking over even our character and our destiny, and we end up becoming a grumpy old man, a nasty old woman, and we don't need any more of those in this world, and I'm absolutely sure there's none here this morning right. <laughs> but that's the way we go. If we don't nip the problem in the bud, we are dead in the water. Let me remind you that Paul is in jail when he wrote those beautiful words that are words about the thoughts he wants us to have. He's in jail when he's talking to us of having the right attitude. He's in jail, in chains, chained to a wall. The jail is under the earth. It's a small room with dirt and stone on every side of it. No windows, zero light, musty smelling and dank. And yet he is telling us about the power of having the right attitude. He 
He begins this part of the letter with these words. You must have the mind of Christ. You absolutely have to if you ever want to be happy. If you ever want to succeed in relationships, you absolutely have to. There it all is, right there, in those words you just heard. Let me just say a few of them. I just, I just can't read them enough or think about them because they're so beautiful. Guard your minds, he said. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, is there any excellence? If there's anything worthy of praise, think about those things. Think about those things. That is all of it. You and I have got to work every minute of every hour of every day to fill our mind with way more positive thoughts about each other than we do. And if we don't, we will become a negative person. It's just that simple and that true. We cannot feed negativity up here all day long starting at 5 or 6 a.m. when we wake up in the morning, all day long, and expect to have a good attitude, a positive attitude. If I spend my day critiquing people, out loud even, or up here alone, thinking negative thoughts about people, putting people down in my mind so that I can look better, so that I don't have to deal with my feelings of coming in second or even failing because you succeeded. If I'm self-righteous in my mind and keep making myself better than you because of my judgment better than you because of my judgment making myself right what will come out of me will not be positive energy it will be negative energy and I'll be another one of those crabby people that walks this crabby planet I am my thoughts I hate that that's true but I am my thoughts if I think I can think negative thoughts and put a smile on my face to hide it and nobody will know what I'm really thinking, that smile will not work because underneath it, I'm a fearful, critical, judgmental, self-righteous person and it will make my heart cold, which will make my eyes cold, which will tell the person sitting across from me that I don't love you really Honey, your judgments are showing. I know you'd rather they not be, but I owe it to tell you your judgments are showing. I see it all the time. I see it in your marriage, too. Attitude is a little thing, a little thing that makes a big difference, my friends. Neither you or I can ever control what happens to us but we can control the way we think about all those events. That is my attitude. And only when I change my attitude, only then will I know the peace of Christ in my heart. I want the peace of Christ in my heart, but I've got to work at that. And my work is to work on my attitude. My work is to work on my attitude. I need to get to know the mind of Christ. I need to study the scriptures. I need to get to know this. I need to read about how he thought about things. I need to get to know the mind of Christ, how Jesus thought, so that I can have his attitude in my mind, so I can have the mind of Christ and begin to speak the words of Christ and eventually have the character of Christ in my family, in my neighborhood, in my parish everywhere. Only then will I know the peace of Christ, and so will everybody around me through me. Only then. When those fearful, judgmental thoughts, those self-righteous thoughts that make me better than you start to enter my mind, I can't control those first incipient initial thinkings of starting to judge, just watching people come back from communion and how they're not doing it right or how they're dressed or whatever it happens to be. I just need to notice it. I won't be able to stop it, but I need to notice it. I need to give it a nod, and then I need to get back on track. Give it over to God. 
and start thinking how Jesus maybe would have thought about that person. We can do this, you guys. Otherwise, it takes over. This is not a side truth to the rest of our lives if we want to live this gospel. These thoughts about the mind are at the heart of it. These thoughts about the mind are at the heart of it. Ironically, that's the truth. Your mind is at the heart of you. This is how real Christian life must become. And if we don't work it out, starting with those inner thoughts, nothing else is going to work out. It's true. So my friends, guard your mind. Guard your mind. And use the stories of scripture and the wisdom of the ages here in this book to correct, to correct your thinking. This is the gift this book has given me over and over again. It's why I love the Bible. I love the Bible. I can't get enough of the Bible. I didn't always used to think like this, but it was another correction to my thought. I am learning how to think from this book right here. Let me conclude with Eleanor Roosevelt one last time. Watch your thoughts. They become words. Watch your words. They become action. Watch your action. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your very character. And watch your character. It will become your final destiny.